this is the first of a few videos on St. Thomas's teaching on habitus. He devotes six questions of the Prima Secundae 49 to 54 to what he calls habitus before he gets on to discussing virtues. And there's a temptation to translate habitus as habits, but that can be a bit misleading in modern English, because in modern English we often think of habits as a kind of nervous tick that takes us over and controls us. Perhaps I can't help scratching my head, even though I don't want to. Or maybe I can't help say um and er uh while speaking, even though I don't want to. And we aren't talking about that kind of habit at all. St Thomas is aware to some extent of what you might call personal chemistry, the kind of patterns of behaviour that we don't really choose and which can be quite important for all sorts of things like which religious order you will fit in or who is best to marry or not marry. I think we need to reflect a lot more on the status of personal chemistry in moral psychology. But St Thomas is aware of what you might call personal chemistry and there's a little paper on it by me in a book edited by Peter Rona and Laszlo Zsolnai entitled Agency and Causal Explanations in Economics where I look at the pre-conscious factors that St Thomas recognised as affecting our behaviour. He gave more role to the heavenly bodies than we do. We would give more to genetics than he does. But these questions of the Prima Secundae aren't about that kind of habit that takes us over. Habitus might be translated as dispositions. Anthony Kenny translated volume 22 of the Blackfriars 60 volume summer in the 1960s and 70s and in his introduction to that volume, he suggests that dispositions is a much better translation in modern English of habitus. I think we might also use the concept of habituation, how we develop techniques and abilities and tendencies so that we can use them when we want to. It's not something that takes us over, it's something we develop that we can use when we want to. We'll see a bit later on that that's a bit mysterious when it comes to virtues in the sense of moral virtues. But St Thomas makes it clear that we are the kind of creature that can be habituated and needs to be habituated. It's part of our experience. We get used to a particular skill, doing a particular job, a pattern of behaviour that we deliberately build up. And to discuss habitus, dispositions, habituation in the way St Thomas does, reminds us of our dependence on each other and in fact our dependence on grace, as his discussion of virtue pans out. In fact, his concept of habitus provides a way of speaking about grace. To a certain extent, health is a kind of habitus. Our body, our whole being, can be well disposed so that we can function well, or badly disposed so that we can't function well. And grace is a kind of quality in the essence of the soul. God moulding what we are so that we can function well 
as children of God. And St Thomas's account of Habitus reminds us of how his account of human nature and human needs has gone on before in the Prima Pars and earlier in the Prima Secundae. We've had a long account of the Passiones Anime, roughly emotions. Questions 22 to 48. We take seriously for our moral life the emotional side of our being and our vulnerability there. So St Thomas, for example, suggests that if we are suffering from tristitia, sadness, depression, grief, the remedy isn't pull yourself together, it's try having a long bath or a good weep or the company of friends. He might say today, um, see if you need some antidepressant drugs for a time. So his discussion of habituation is actually very important in his moral theology. It points to the possibility of moral and personal growth and helps us begin to see what we need for moral and personal growth. It helps us see what kind of psyche it is, what kind of life it is, in which God's grace takes flesh.